Good evening, good morning to everyone, all of our audiences all over the world, to the Americas, whether it's your breakfast or your lunch, we're so happy that you are able to join us in this live talk direct from Paris, L'Ecole, the School of Jewelry Arts. We're very thrilled tonight, a very interesting topic, the stage jewels of the Comédie Française, a very hallowed institution in France you're going to learn a lot more about tonight. And we also wanted to welcome you and tell you that you can participate in the chat. I'm sure you've already met Céline and Anazita, who are behind their screens, uh, assiduously watching your chat and also collecting your questions, because we'll have a little bit of time at the end to answer your questions. I think you all know the drill. And we're in this beautiful 18th century uh, neoclassical decor room we'll talk about a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And also, we have a very big surprise for you tonight. You're going to see a preview of this exhibition of the stage jewels of the Comédie Française. It's an exhibition that will be open to the public shortly in the future. We will keep you informed. But tonight, we're going to reveal some of the secrets. I think you all know who I am. I'm Paul Parody from L'Ecole, the School of Jewelry Arts. I'm really honored and proud to introduce you to my colleague. Juliane Berardini, a very talented art historian, and she's also a professor and lecturer here at L'Ecole. Now we'd like to actually, we're, we have the honor to introduce to you Madame Agathe Saint-Jouan. She's actually the curator of this exhibition, and she's also the director of the Museum Library of the Comédie Française. So a warm welcome to Agathe, who we're going to join right now. Bonjour, bienvenue Hello, à des and welcome to the School of Jewelry Arts for this uh, exhibition on the jewelry at the Comédie Française. I'm going to say a few words about this institution that you may not know. The Comédie Française is a national theater in France. It is the number one theater that was founded by Louis XIV in 1680. And it is a troupe which has played and in interrupted since that period up until now. In this theater, the actors are Keep, they stay here permanently, they have a fixed troupe, and they play a whole repertory of pieces with roughly 3,000 uh, plays. That's the, what we call the repertory. There's a whole catalog of, of plays that have been played. And the mission is both to enrich that repertory with new plays, but also to play the older ones. The actors do that thanks to the, all of the teams, the technical teams, and they do it as well based on a very particular system that's called alternance. In other words, we play a different a play every evening and always four or five running at the same time uh, in the Richelieu Theater, which is the main historical theater. We have two other rooms. So this is a bit of the way it works. It is a theater that has a very long history. We also have a heritage of exception which goes back to the, the very foundation, the founding. We have archives of works of art, of painting and sculptures and drawings, everything having to do with the creation. There are costumes and decorations and objects as well, uh, very unusual objects, and, a, and a, a library of texts as well. And we also have stage jewelry, and that is what we're going to be talking about tonight. That's what's on stage tonight in this partnership between the, uh, the School of uh, Jewelry Art and the Comédie Française. So this is a research area. We don't know much about these jewelry. We had to research these in archives and uh, what were the plays were they used in, who ordered them, who financed them. And once that work had been done, we wanted it well to restore uh, these, you know, these jewels and this was funded by the School of Jewelry Arts and that consisted in cleaning them up and, um, and, and, and restoring uh, some things that were lacking. Some things had been damaged over time. So that's basically what the basic groundwork was and is. And we wanted to, uh, to uh, show these um, jewels off and that's the purpose of this exhibition that's about to open. So, Chilian, as you know, at L'Ecole, we love to have three chapters to tackle this very interesting topic. What are our three chapters tonight? 
So first, we will try to define this very particular concept of um, stage jewelry. Uh, we will analyze its role in theater economics uh, from an aesthetic and material perspective. And then we will take a look at the reforms and changes that occurred during the 19th century. And finally, we will see the influence of some actors and actresses, the big stars of the late 19th century on the evolution of stage jewelry. So, shall we start? Yes. What is stage jewelry? Let's just have a basic definition. I think it's one of our goals of tonight. Yes, so the simplest definition might be that it's uh, a jewel that is used on stage, but we will try to give more specific characteristics. And to do that, we will dive into the period covered uh, by the exhibition, the, the 18th century and the 19th century. Unfortunately, we no longer have uh, pieces from uh, the, the 18th century, but we do have a lot of archives and documents uh, to, to learn from that, from that time. So talking about documents, could you tell us more, Paul, about the, the sources that were studied by the curator? Yes, certainly, with pleasure. We historians, we love, in France, there's many, many archives. It's uh, very rich uh, for that. And uh, Madame Saint-Jouan, of course, found these archives. This is actually a registry. It's a registry of jewelry that performs. It's a registry that mentions all of the props, all of the jewelry, stage jewelry, and things necessary for the production of plays. And you, would, you might even be surprised to hear that 10% of these productions have stage jewelry. So this is the time for, to tell you about our first category of stage jewelry. It's jewelry that is a proper prop that actually tells the story. And these types of jewels and elements are supplied by the theater. You should also know that in the 17th and 18th centuries, actors and actresses were responsible for providing their costumes. And we're going to talk about another category of jewelry in a minute. So you can imagine it was a quite costly affair in terms of their costumes. But what we see in this register is we see a play, Atali. It's, a, it's a, one of the tragedies, a biblical tragedy, which we'll talk a little bit more about later today. And we see uh, on the second line, it talks about a royal headband, the, the symbol of power which is worn. It talks about a scepter. It talks also about a sword. So we know that these, these items were used in this play, Atali, which you can see on the top. It's very interesting that we're able to use these. What do we mean by jewels that play, jewels that perform? Well, in French plays, for example, in, in the play, the, the Fourbin, uh, sorry, uh, Scapin, there's a character named, um, uh, uh, one of the characters in the play named Zerbinette, and she was uh, kidnapped as a young girl by, by uh, dealers or gypsies or slave, slave traders. And later in the plot, she's recognized by her family because she's wearing a, a diamond bracelet. So again, it tells the story. This diamond bracelet tells her story that she's actually from a very a prosperous father, and it allows her to marry Leander, her great love. Jewelry can also play the role it substitutes money. For example, in one other French play, there's a lady who's attacked in her, in her chaise à porteur, in her sedan chair, and a man comes to save her. She gives him a diamond to, 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 to thank, thank him, him rather than money. And there's another role that jewels can play. It's a character trait. You've all heard of The Miser, I think, the very famous play by Molière. There's a very famous scene where the miser won't give the diamond to his love, Marianne. So again, illustrating his character trait of being greedy. So jewels can play all of these roles. And again, when they do play these roles, they're supplied by the theater. So you're talking about the first type of jewels. Are there any real jewels on stage? Very good question, Gillian. What's interesting, we're so lucky to have these portraits, these beautiful portraits. This one's by Donna, uh, Donna Nonot, a great French painter of the 18th century. And what we see in this portrait is this lady is, she's playing a Roman empress. She is Agrippina. She's Nero's mother. There's nothing very Roman about her costume, and that's because in the 18th century, people didn't mind. She's wearing a beautiful French robe à panier. She has the Turkish dolman over it, which she also had narrowed to, to be the French style. She's a beautiful uh, sil a silver embroidered fabric, maybe a little hint to the Orient. But look at her jewels. She's le literally decked out. She's wearing in her hair, she has what we call an aigrette with diamonds and pearls. She has a, a double pearl necklace, a choker. She has the pearls uh, coming down, 
Don't forget these are natural pearls, and so they were worth a fortune. All of those diamonds and the two earrings that are, which are called girondoles, very in fashion in France in 1750. So what's interesting here is she's showing us her fame, and she's also thanking the people who might have given her these jewels. These are her personal jewels. So our second category of stage jewels are jewels worn by the actors and actresses to uh, show off, if you will, and to show their status. So there are some inconsistencies sometimes yes, between the characters that they play exactly. and their costumes. And it was a, in France, people accepted it was convention, yes, right? Yes, yes. And maybe we can have a look at uh, the, the next, uh, the next uh, piece of art, which is an engraving uh, from 1741. Uh, it is a play uh, that called Le Philosophe Marié. And in this scene, uh, you can see that the women are all wearing the, um, the same pearl necklaces. Uh, but they are actually mistresses and servants. Um, so the image represented to, to the audience is in contradiction with the, the drama, the plot, uh, but at this time, actors really like to show off all of their jewels, and there were inconsistencies, but the, the, the audience accepted them. Uh, so, so we can see through this piece of art that um, the second type of jewelry that is purely ornamental can be confused with private jewels. Yes, and what's interesting too uh, that we found that uh, that we found through well the Comédie Française found through research when you see these images sometimes it's hard to discern some of the personal jewels might even be imitation. Mm -hmm. France was known for very high quality imitation pearls from the end of the 17th century. Mm -hmm. There was a certain Jacquin. He developed little blown glass beads which he would fill with a solution of fish scales and they called that essence of the Orient. So it's very complex as jewelry historians and, and also uh, stage historians to decipher. So we can only have hypotheses today. So what other kind of jewels do we wear on stage? Well, we wear personal jewels on stage to shine. It's actually a way of, of the actress showing that she has status that we talked about earlier to thank her benefactors. But there's something that we should tell you if you look at this portrait of a wonderful actress, Adrienne Lecouvreur, legendary. She died young. She became, a, in her own life, she was actually sort of a hero. She died at 37. She was Voltaire's favorite. And what's interesting here is what you don't see in this portrait is that the audience is seated all around her. In the French theater until probably the middle, you'll, you'll tell us later, middle to the late 18th century, the, the privileged audience members were sitting on either side of the actresses. So they needed, and they were talking, and they would interrupt. So the actress really had to stand out. She had to show who she was. And also, let's not forget, the light was very dim. So one of the functions of private jewelry, look at her bodice, again, this beautiful, fashionable French uh, robe à la française. She, would, she had her own collection of pearls and stones, which she would have sewn onto the bodice. She's wearing pearls uh, sort of woven through her hair. And again, here we are. She is Monima. She's actually a, a queen, a to-be queen from Pontus, which is uh, present-day Anatolia. So again, she looks like a French courtier because she's wearing a court dress, which was probably offered to her. Again, so her private jewels are on her bodice and in her hair, and it's to shine to show her star status, isn't it? Yes, and there is another jewel uh, at the bottom left. Uh, it's very discreet in this portrait, but I think it's very important to understand the plot. Could you tell us more? Yes, thank you for reminding us. On the bottom left, you can see uh, a headband. It's a royal headband, if you will. It's made of fabric and it's bejeweled. And the reason why that's there is because this is a very specific scene in this play, which is Mithridates. So Mithridates is her promised uh, love, the king Mithridates. He's away at war, and he's losing in battle, and the Romans are at the doors of the palace. So he sends an order for Monim, this lady, to commit suicide. So she tries a first time with the royal headband, mm -hmm. and it tears. So this is what we see on the floor. It's the royal headband that failed. she failed to use to hang herself. There's a whole monologue where she says, oh, you cursed fabric, couldn't you at least help me with this evil, this final deed? And in French theater, they're not going to show the violence. So what they show uh, as a de trois in this portrait, he shows the scene right after. She's failed to kill herself with this headband, so she's given poison and she's holding the poison cup and of course her servant is trying to tell her, please don't do it but we're in tragedy, so she yeah. does.
for so example. to show you this is this would have been a jewel that would have been supplied by the theater itself yes so now that we know that there are two types of jewelry uh, we will join Agathe Saint Jean in the exhibition to talk about uh, the materials and the craftsmanship The exhibition opens up with a first showcase that you're going to discover with me here. There are two uh, jewels from this, uh, the diadem and a comb, which are characteristic of the techniques used by uh, stage jewelry. We're going to be interested in this technique. We're going to look first of all at the comb, which is a comb that was uh, built in fall. All of these scene jewelry were used with imitation materials. They're not precious materials. Nonetheless, they call upon knowledge and know-how that are equivalent to the techniques that are used in high jewelry. In this comb, for example, you will see that it's ornated with very small pearls, which are fake pearls, they're glass pearls, that are coated with the orient essence, which uh, render the same brilliance as real pearls. And each of these small pearls is strung, strung onto a silver wire that follows the shape of a curved core. So that in itself is already a technological prowess. And below that, you have a floral frieze, which has been done in, a, in, in three different kinds of gold. So we, uh, there's a finesse of realization and a, attention to detail that is exceptional, and the materials are fake. So one wonders why, why? Uh, do we have this kind of paradox, both in the use of fake uh, material, but also the quality of the, of the work is exceptional. In terms of the imitation materials, it's easy to understand. Theater does not have a huge resources, and they can't uh, allow themselves to use uh, real raw materials, precious materials. And these jewels are used to play in a theater. We use them, and we exchange them, and we might uh, hurt them, we might have to be thrown on the ground, so they have to be solid. So the feature of these materials, of substitute materials, is if they get damaged, it's easy to redo them or repair them. It's much easier to find this type of uh, material than to find precious uh, material. In addition, another thing that's important for actors is why do you want to wear to spend so, so much time on something that's going to be seen from far away. For actors or the actresses, it helps in the credibility of their personage. And so all of these factors in the theater, and especially in the Comédie Française, were produced with the same care. For costumes, we use high uh, couture uh, techniques for each uh, element. So this is art which is close to reality, uh, even though it is fake. The other piece, is on the same principle. Here we have a diadem with stars, which is mounted on tremolo. Now tremolos are very small springs that we put behind each star so that the actress, when she walks, it, the stars shine, and thanks to the movement, which, that, which moves the stars as well. So we find this often in precious jewelry, the same kind of arrangement. These are not diamonds. These are glass-faceted um, stones, which gives this particular aspect. So, Julian, should we continue yes. into our second part? Yes, so in the first chapter, we learned that there are two types of state jewelry. The first one is absolutely necessary to understand the plot, and in that case, it is provided uh, by the theater. And the second type is purely ornamental to make the actors shine. And in that case, the actors and actresses are responsible for, for them. We also learned that there are some inconsistencies between the drama and the costumes, but it was well accepted by the audience of the 18th century. But in the middle of the 18th century, some actors and the French playwright Voltaire led a reform. They wanted um, the, the, the aesthetic on stage, so the costumes, the sets, the jewels, to better match the spirit of the play. And so this idea gradually gained ground and it, take, uh, it took root um, in the 18th, uh, 19th century. So let's look at the first example, neoclassicism. Of course, when you're playing a Roman emperor mm -hmm. in, a, in a tragedy, you wear the laurel crown. This is evidence of trying to bring the, the story closer to the actual props to make it look more authentic. 
And on the left, what's interesting is this actor's name was Le Quint. This is a wonderful guache in the archives of the, of the Comédie Française. And he's actually playing Nero, and he's wearing a very credible toga, and he also has a laurel crown in his head. He was one of the people who was pushing for this reform. And what's moving on the right, we see this beautiful crown, which is actually made of paper, if you can imagine. It's extremely fragile and rare. And Talma, who's an actor that Agat is going to tell you a lot more about in a minute, he was uh, the successor of Lucien, and he would play all the toga roles. He loved uh, these, these tragedies from antiquity, and he loved playing Nero. And this beautiful paper crown, it's it's cold embossed on the leaves to give those beautiful veins, and it even has the little berries uh, around it. So you can see that the, the workmanship is, is absolutely incredible, even though we're talking about a stage jewel, and it's of utmost delicacy, isn't it? It is. So what other connections do we have between, yes. let's say, politics, um, power, and yeah. the stage. You may have recognized this very famous painting from the Musée du Louvre. Uh, this drawing was made after it uh, by the painter David himself. And this uh, painting shows the links between three men, the actor Talma, uh, mentioned by Paul, David, the painter, and the emperor Napoleon. Because at the time, uh, politics were really linked to, to theater. And this piece of art uh, really celebrates uh, this very important um, order by, uh, by the emperor himself, but it's, it also illustrates uh, the mutual efforts uh, by Talma and David to reform the aesthetic on stage in a neoclassical way, this antique style that really characterized Napoleon's reign. And let's talk about laurel crowns. There's a beautiful, yes. let's move There's on it, because as one. you know, Napoleon was wearing a golden laurel crown in, 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 the, in, the, in his coronation. And let's go to Agat, and she'll tell us about a very, very historically important piece in the collection. In the 19th century, scene jewelry was represented in this different types of aesthetic through the theater arts. We started in the beginning of the 19th century with a neoclassical uh, type in France that started under the French Revolution and was deployed under the First Empire. This style was inspired by archaeological discoveries and by the influence of some artists, such as Jacques-Louis David, who we just spoke about. We're going to be looking at the first piece, which is a crown of laurel, which belonged to Talma, a comedian, one of the biggest uh, tragic actors in the French comedy. He started his career under the revolution, and he had a huge influence on, under the empire. He was, had a lot of influence, not only in dramatic arts, in, in plays, and in reforms that, that were going to be implemented with Jacques-Louis David to change the decoration and costumes. But also, he had a lot of influence because he's very close to the Emperor Napoleon. This object is characteristic of this proximity, since this is a crown that was given to him by Napoleon himself to play the role of Nero in the piece of Jean Racine Britannicus. It's a magnificent object. There are laurel leaves. We were even able to think that this crown was inspired by, the, uh, by Napoleon's uh, crown when he was crowned. And the degree of finesse is exceptional. It, if you get close to it, you can see that not only the leaves are represented, but we also see the fruit. And so the laurel crown symbol, uh, symbolizes the victory and strength and force of the empire, as it were force of, of Nero, obviously, but also of Napoleon. This object is in a box that's specifically designed for this purpose. And inside the box, there is an engraving which shows Talma playing the role of Nero. And there's an inscription by hand that indicates the emperor says to Talma, after having seen him play Nero, Talma, you are, we are making history, you're creating history. So this is an important story in this uh, story because it shows how an object such as this one can signify a very strong relationship that existed between the theater and politics at the beginning of the 19th century. You can imagine that uh, Emperor Napoleon or ordered the players in the, in the Comédie Française to leave with him and follow him around. He had them play in Erfurt in 1808 when he gathered together all the princes of Europe and in, under a, diplomac, a diplomatic mission which failed, but the play was a success. 
which shows the excellence of this troop. So this is really uh, an action of propaganda. And then this relationship is expressed not only with respect to foreign powers, but also in France itself, because we say that Talma incarnated in Paris the permanence of the po political authority where Napoleon was very often absent. He was very often on the roads around Europe in a campaign. Have, after speaking about Talma and the neoclassical style, we're going to move on to the following period, i.e. 1820 to 1830, with the period of Romanticism. Romanticism would be expressed not by a unity in style, but by a variety. On the contrary, the idea was really to concentrate on the picturesque and local color of each period, and to play upon local color, as we say, we're going to be going into all regions and epochs to represent the proper image of that framework. The idea is to give a framework to the play which would be personalized as a function of the topic being dealt with. And in that framework, obviously, the number of jewelry items exploded on the stage. There was also an increase in the amount of jewelry worn and the people taking care of it. Paris became a real uh, hinge area for producing the type of jewelry that was used during this period. And here we have two pieces that belong to a very important actress called Rachel. Rachel, at the beginning of her career in 1838, is really a, someone who marked the history of French uh, theater in general. She was one of the first uh, uh, vedettes. And she went to Russia, to the US, and so forth, where she would play. And she paid a lot of attention to the design of her costumes and her jewelry. And the role of Fedra, as you can see in this uh, showcase, we have two crowns that were used when she played Fedra in theater. She's going to have many types of these crowns, one for the first act and a different one entirely for the second act. The first uh, diadem, which was in the first act, was an act of, the, of, of intimacy where she's going to be uh, in, admitting that she's in love with the son of her husband, which is a real problem uh, for her, obviously. And so it is a, a, a jewelry that she chose to express that intimacy. And this band, which is stamped and covered with, a, with, a, with shells and cameos, there's something that's quite exceptional but also very fragile. Whereas in the second act, we have a, a different item. So this is the second crown. Here, this is an explosion of uh, her full power, because thinking that her husband was dead, she was able to pretend to being inheriting the throne and to admit her love for the young man. So that this was an expression of uh, loyalty. And in this crown, we see that there's something unusual as well, and that's the fact that it was given to the actress by the theater itself. And this is quite atypical. This was never done. But you, now the context of that gift was that she was very young, and the public was only coming to see her. And the theater was very uh, worried that she might leave and go to a different theater. So we offered her uh, this crown as a way of uh, securing her uh, her loyalty to the theater as, a, as, a, as an actress. So the crown is written, offered to Miss Rachel by the Comédie Française. That's what's inscri inscribed in. It's a really sumptuous crown. These are uh, fake uh, materials. It's a copper uh, alloy in, in which we have encrusted uh, gl glass stones, but are absolutely faultless imitations of the real thing. So the, these are jewels that she always um, wore every time she played Fedra. And there was a third crown, which unfortunately was, not, uh, was lost. But there are many images of it. And here you have a statue of Rachel. As you can see, you can see the crown on her head and the sculpture from that time. And she, here she's playing Fedra still. So this is a diadem which is uh, fully made out of gold but it's molded onto the band. 
And now, in addition to the diadem, there, there was a collar, uh, very characteristic. We can see this, her uh, wearing this type of uh, article uh, frequently. And if you get closer to the sculpture, you can also see that her ears are pierced, which is a sign that very probably she was wearing uh, a pair of uh, earrings. It's to say how important jewels were essential for Rachel, and the sculptor even thought of adding those to her statue. Unfortunately, the earrings were not um, conserved. So tell us, who are these craftsmen, these craftsmen making stage jewelry? Paris became a veritable capital, didn't it? Yes. I heard that after 1840, there was over 2,000 of them. Absolutely. Um, the, the Romantic era during the 19th century is a time of great development for stage jewelry. Uh, craftsmen um, made a lot of technical progress. They imitated uh, gemstones and pearls perfectly. And so there were more and more craftsmen specialized in, uh, in stage jewelry making. It actually became a French specialty during the 19th century. And these craftsmen, they combined different techniques, several techniques actually, uh, techniques relating to, to stage jewelry, but also to armory and to church silverware. And even if the materials were fake, the techniques uh, were not, they were the same used as in, uh, in traditional jewelry, as well as the knowledge required to produce these pieces. And here you have um, a masterpiece of the neo-Gothic aesthetic. It's a dagger, a small one, a very small one that was uh, used by a French actor, uh, actress Marie Dorval. And uh, you can see on one side there is a woman and a child and on the other side there is a skeleton and a skull. So this piece symbolizes life and death. And it's a very interesting piece because it's actually really small but there are uh, many, many details. It's, it's richly uh, chased. And um, it's very surprising and interesting according to me because there are so many details, but no one in the audience is going to, to see them from, from 10 or 15 meters away. So it's very interesting. It's incredible work of gilt bronze chasing, etc. And if you're interested in who some of these people were, one of the authors in the catalog of the exhibition, Madame Lublinner Matatia, she has actually created a, a whole dictionary a dictionary. Of the so, so, for future reference for all of you who are going to run <laughs> to to look at the catalog. So we see, thanks to this piece, that there, are, there is an archaeological approach to, to stage jewelry. Are there any other forms, styles, eras, or countries that are copied at the time? Yes, fortunately, for the, your question is, is perfect. Thank you. We talk about the Orient. The Orient was very vast in, in the imaginations of the time. Unlike a Western culture, which they understood through archaeological uh, finds, etc., the Orient rest stayed very broad, whether we're talking about the near, the near Orient, the Middle East, or the Far East. It was the idea, like, like um, Madame uh, uh, Saint-Jean said, it was important to, to keep it picturesque. So the sources for stage jewelry of the Orient are not very, uh, they're not very scientific. And what's funny is this crown, uh, it's one of the masterpieces of the uh, collection of the, of the Comédie Française, and they identified uh, what it was, what, they made a lot of identifications around it in around 2011, but it's beautifully made, just like the crowns that we saw before with a, with a copper alloy with beautifully gilt. It has vegetal um, motifs all up the top, beautiful imitation gemstones, pearls, imitation, beautifully made imitation pearls at the top. But what, what about these spikes? Where did they get the idea for these, these pointed edges? What's interesting is uh, we think that they got the idea because somebody thought of it in the 18th century and it becomes a convention. And if you look on, this was worn by a Madame, Mademoiselle Rocourt. She was actually playing uh, the role of Cleopatra. Cleopatra, not Cleopatra VII, but a Cleopatra much earlier. She was the queen of Syria. And on the right, you can see her wearing this crown in 1807, and she's actually putting a curse on her son. She's jealous that he's in love with the princess, Rodogun. And she's saying, may you have unhappiness, may your union bring you um, horror, and hopefully a son that looks like me. So uh, you can see the idea of, 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 of this Syrian queen. But you should also know that another actress wore 
wore this uh, a crown very similar for another play, Atali, which we talked about, which is a queen of Judea, so a completely different part of the world. And also, some of the ladies of the stage wore it for Semiramis, who's the queen of Babylonia. So again, the source is not scientific, but it becomes a custom. Yeah. And everybody, when they see this pointed crown, they think of the Orient. Yeah, it's a very common model during the, the 19th century. Yes. We see it on, on a lot of portraits yes. of actresses. So, what, if, what is our third chapter? I love this are, chapter, the, the Monstre to, Sacré. Yes, the Monstre Sacré. So it was an expression invented by Jean Cocteau, who was a, a famous playwright and artist uh, in France. And he wanted to, uh, to use this expression to talk about the actors that uh, were very important for him when he was young. Um, and this expression describes um, the, the actors of the, the 1900s, uh, actors whose talent exceeded uh, normal human level so he's he's thinking about the dancer Isadora Duncan but we can also talk about Sarah Bernard, Edouard de Max, Mounet Sully or Julia Barté. Uh, these uh, actors are in the exhibition and we are going to talk about them right now. So this is really a veritable star system isn't it that it we're is. talking about? The the century. It's a star system these people were veritable public stars and we start with Edouard de Max. He was a very colorful performer. He as well loved to play Nero in Britannicus. We saw early on all those other actors. He was known for being very flamboyant. He was uh, slightly effeminate. He had a Romanian accent, but it was all part of his charm. He was called the man of the robes. He wore so many different togas. And he was known to wear rings on every finger. You can see in the photo, he's covered with that, that cross uh, jewel, that belt across his chest, which is uh, probably imitation turquoise. He's got uh, rings. He's, he's very stern in the way he's looking at us. We get a feel for, he was, as we can say, a little bit over the top. And he played this role for 20 years. It was his favorite role. And on the top of his head, what do we see? Yes, we a see laurel crown. the laurel crown that you can see on the, on the left. Um, he probably made research to, to create this model that is actually two models combined. So we can see the, the, the classic laurel crown that we talked about earlier. And you can see some arches, some spikes uh, covered with um, fake gemstones imitating emerald. Um, and we know that on some Roman coins, Nero was actually wearing this kind of crown with spikes. So he probably was inspired by it. Um, but he combined the two models to create a new one. Yes, he did his own research. And what's interesting, he too, did. on this piece, you can see the sort of soldering. It was repaired mm -hmm. and yeah, reused over and over again. It's really a typical stage mm -hmm. jewel, probably made within the confines of the theater. So if there was one artist who paid attention to historical detail, it was uh, Mr. Mounet Sully. He loved to research. He, loved, he was one of the great stars, just like de Max, for 40 years in the Comédie Française. And he actually, for this particular role, which is, uh, uh, those, we talked about it earlier, he's playing a sort of a, a king of ancient Israel. And we talked about the play earlier, Atali. And he wanted to actually be very, uh, he wanted to be very accurate about what the temple looked like, etc. He went to talk to a rabbi to, to talk about the gestures, to talk about what are the, the holy vestments that they were wearing. And there was a lady in that photo on the right that, yes. that actually remembers him. Yes, and she said he wanted to embellish them with all that the most meticulous historical research could add to the brilliance of their performance. He spared neither reading, nor time, nor trouble. Who among the artists who took part in the interminable rehearsals for Atali doesn't remember the efforts he made to reconstruct, according to the text, the inner appearance of the Temple of Jehovah, to rediscover the forgotten rites of the Hebrew religion, and to oblige us to assume priestly poses, which he believed were indispensable to the general effect of Rassin's tragedy. So he focused on the jewelry uh, worn by the high priest uh, who officiated in the Temple of Jerusalem before it was destroyed. And we know, thanks to the, the Old Testament, that it was precisely described. And we know it's made of several elements. Yes, the pectoral, as we call it, the priestly breastplate, is described in detail in Exodus 28. I'll read just a little bit of it. it consists of a pectoral, a robe, a woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. The priest wore the hoshen, placed like a shield over his heart, over the ephod. The instructions given by the Eternal to produce this sacred jewel were detailed at length. 
Fashion a breastplate for making decisions, the work of skilled hands. You shall make it of the same material as the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine twisted linen. It shall be square and double. The, the important part is actually, you shall set it with an adornment of four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, an emerald. The second row, a carbuncle, a sapphire, a diamond. The third row, an opal, an agate, an amethyst. The fourth row, a chrysolite, an onyx, a jasper. These stones will be set in gold settings. There shall be 12 of them corresponding to the names of the sons of Israel. They shall be engraved like seals, each with the name of one of the 12 tribes. So you can see he actually went back to these texts to, to uh, understand what this priestly breastplate looked like. Yes, but he but wasn't the only one, he was, was he? He was not the first one because um, Agathe Saint-Jean, when he, she made her research, she found actually this invoice from 1761. And we know thanks to it um, that there was another commission for a, a breastplate that is worn on this, on this drawing. Um, and it was probably made with fake materials, but it might have been precious enough because it was repaired several times. So it was used and repaired. Again, these great discoveries by, uh, by uh, Agatha to make this such a rich experience, mm -hmm. this, uh, this uh, exhibition. Now, what does it look like, the final piece? Yes, this is the result. Um, so um, we know that the structure, as you can see, is in fabric and textile, according to the text. Uh, but the settings are not in gold, because this is a stage jewel, so it's made in copper. And the gemstones have been replaced by uh, glass beads um, with a, what we call a foil, a colored foil at the back of the, of the glass to give an impression of color. So he researched this meticulously, and this was found. I got found this in the in the treasures of the costumes of the Comédie Française, as well as those documents. So you're probably wondering in the chat. I'm sure people are asking, when what, are we about, talking what about, about Sarah Bernhardt? She was really the golden voice, the divine. She was so talented. She entered in the Comédie Française when she was barely 17. She got fired very quickly because she slapped another actress to protect her sister. She goes on to have a huge career. Uh, she makes her debuts uh, all over the world, especially well, later in her career, but mm -hmm. in France as well. And some of her great roles are shown at the lower part in these beautiful photos. Mm -hmm. It's the era of, the, of photos, isn't it? Yes, from the 1850s, uh, we have uh, pictures of stars spread all over Europe. And, uh, and Sarah Bernard really used this, uh, this media to, to spread her pictures of herself. And by the way, we had a conversation yes, at we Call, an online conversation that you can uh, see on our website uh, about photography and jewelry. Yes, you look at the former talk section of the website. But let's look at Sarah. She was actually a very successful, world-known world actress. She traveled to the five continents, and she became very wealthy at some point in her career. So she had the luxury of calling upon very well-known jewelers, fine jewelers. On the left, she's playing Isail, who's uh, she's actually an Indian courtesan. And Lalik, René Lalik, the great father of Art Nouveau jewels, he creates this beautiful lotus on her, on her bodice, which is actually sort of a bluish, it's stage jewelry, it's not precious, but it's a beautiful bluish uh, hue flower, uh, which if you look at photos of it, it's in a private collection. She also had the luxury of ha asking Lalik to create for her this crown, one of her favorite roles, The Faraway Princess, by Edmond Rostand. He wrote it specifically for her, for her theater. And she's wearing this crown with lilies. It's probably metal, uh, like, like the jewels we have here, and imitation pearls, but it became her trademark. So much so that there was a second version made for another actress, which still exists today. And you know, this Princess Lointaine, this faraway princess, was so popular for her that Lalique actually made her a precious jewel as well, which if you come to our Art Nouveau course, we'll show it you to you. See. And finally, Lalique created for her this, this actually headpiece, this huge headpiece. Probably Theodora was one of her most opulent costumes, yeah, covered in gemstones. You can see she loved belts. She had a huge collection of belts. 
And this piece is so covered in gems that it veritably becomes yes, actually, the, the costume. The costume, becomes costume the jewel. is covered with pearls and gemstones, and the costume becomes the jewel, and the actress herself becomes a jewel on stage. And she was also, just like in the 18th century that we saw those ladies, she brought modern jewelry onto the stage mm -hmm. and blended it. So here we're in Art Nouveau, which is actually quite avant-garde, and uh, Lalique and Fouquet, the snake, Fouquet made her a snake that's crawling up her arm. So very unusual and a very unusual lady mm -hmm. with a, a career that was incredible worldwide. One of her favorite roles. Yeah, she's also wearing a costume that is covered with pearls, and this crown was made to match her costume. You can see the fake pearls and f fake diamonds, but actually the quality is so, is so good, the quality of the materials and the quality of the, the craftsmanship is so good that it's hard to tell the difference between um, this type of jewel, state jewelry, and traditional jewelry. Yes, we Blast was one of her great roles. Mm -hmm. It was her triumph early in her career. Now, Let's talk about a couple of other great stars of the mm -hmm. time. We're going to go to Agathe and learn about another great star of the time. She was actually, she was actually a rival a little bit yes. of Sarah Bernhardt, Julia Barthé. After Sarah Bernard, we're going to be looking at another actress, Julia Barthé, another actress from the Belle Époque. She succeeded Sarah Bernhardt at the Comédie Française to play the heroines of tragedies and romantic. Sarah Bernhardt was very independent and she wanted to see other uh, shows, so she left the Comédie Française in 1880. And a few months before, they hired Julie Barthé, the actress, to take over the roles in the tragedy and romantic uh, comedies. She was really part of the uh, affiliation with Sarah Bernard. She's going to be playing a certain number of famous roles. One of the main roles she played was Berenice in the play by Jean Racine. For that uh, costume, she drew inspiration from a watercolor that was offered to her by the painter Gustave Moreau. Now, this was a costume that was inspired by the watercolor, which represents Hélène on the wall of the city of Troy. Uh, so there's a diadem, a tiara, and there's a belt and that extends onto a bib on the bodice of the initial costume. So it's going to be very successful in, in this uh, play. She created the piece in 1893 uh, and 1899, we don't know why, but she redid a different tiara. Maybe the previous one was broken, we don't know. But she's not using a classical supplier uh, from the theater. She uh, calls upon René Lalique, and he was a supplier of Sarah Bernard. Perhaps she was inspired by the person that had preceded her to no longer use normal manufacturers, but an authentic jeweler, and a jeweler that was avant-garde, because the leak was above all a precursor of Art Nouveau. This piece, which you can see in this uh, showcase, which is exceptional, which was loaned to us by the Ambedé Museum in Versailles, the tiara is comprised of acanthus uh, leaves and palmettos, you can see in the center of palmettos, there's a blue enamel cabochon. Now, these, they use materials that were not often used in high jewelry. They're less precious materials, sometimes a bit difficult to work on in this type of object. They use glass as well, obviously, as we see in the background. In the second area, you have five cameos representing Roman women in their daily lives. And the last one, the upper area is inspired from Egypt with hieratic Egyptian ivory figures at the top of the tiara. Now they were joined by open wings and lotus uh, leaves. All of that, the metal was used aluminum. That was the metal used. So much for this. They're using the new tiara and they continue to use the former jewels and the rest of her jewels, which were already present in 93, 1893. So the collar, the, the bib linked to the belt, the belt which presented various figures of Griffon, the lion, a dragon. We can see with these two actors or actresses and Julia Barthé, there's a real passage from the use of theater jewelers 
they, they would start using authentic jewelers to design uh, ju uh, theater jewelry. And we're going to move on to the last part of the exhibition. I'll leave you in the busy hands of uh, Julia. So while we make this transition, uh, we're going to enter the contemporary period, actually. Uh, as, uh, Agatha is going to explain to us that a lot of these, these artisans, these craftsmen, they disappeared. And in the 20th century, the actual jewels are made in the workshops, as they were before. It was a little mm -hmm. of both. So um, when we arrive at this, at this masterpiece uh, that was born on stage in the 1980s, uh, we have Agatha who's going to explain to us the importance of the jewel. I don't want to give too many spoilers, but as you can see, it's quite, it's quite, uh, it's quite um, spectacular with all of the beads, etc., etc. Starting at the end of the 19th century, we are now in 1980. We wanted to conclude the exhibition on a more contemporary piece, which shows how today we produce stage jewelry. After the 19th century, the period of uh, theater jewelry creators is at the beginning of the 20th century. We are really in a system that looks more like a costume making. And for this piece, is a piece that was used in a theater of a, a play of Racine called Esther. It was directed by Françoise Seigné in, eight, in 1987, and Jean-Paul Beignet produced a mock-up of the costume, both the clothing, the costume, and the headdress. Now, this uh, mock-up is interpreted by the, by the jewelers, which made proposals, even for accessories and, uh, and special jewelry needed for performances. So this is no longer a niche for manufacturers who specialize in stage jewelry. Here you have a metallic structure that's used as a basis for the diadem, which is an old structure because it dates back to the 19th century, most probably, on which we posed uh, more recent elements that we find that we can find in commerce at the time, such as sequins. But there are also more uh, former, uh, older um, items that we must have found in inventory in lapis lazuli and uh, ceramic, which are older, uh, of older origin. So the whole assembly of pieces from different epochs and this kind of recycling of old with the new to produce a new uh, headdress. That's the way it works today still for a jewelries and costumes used in theater. And a costume designer can use embroidery from the 18th century that we still have in stock so that we can use that to design a new costume. And that uh, helps us to use the, that is behind the, quality of production at the Comédie Française. So we're at the, almost the end of our talk. We, yeah. It always goes by so quickly, doesn't it? Yes. But Juliana, I think you have something to tell us yes, about. Yes, we wanted to show you the catalog of the exhibition uh, published under the direction of Guillaume Glorieux and Agathe Saint-Jean, and it's available in English. So we would like to, to actually, before we take your questions with Agathe, to, uh, to, to actually take advantage of her vast knowledge, we wanted to talk to you about our next talk, which will actually take place from the Cluny Museum. It's the French National Museum of um, the Medieval Art. And we're actually going to have a talk about rock crystal, which was one of the very important gems in the Middle Ages. And we invite you all to come there on the 21st at 7 p.m. Paris time. And we have other places yes, too. Yes, the we? actuality of the school is very rich all over the world with our permanent campuses. So the one in Hong Kong opened in 2019. Uh, our campus in Shanghai opened just a few weeks ago and our next campus is about to open in Dubai. So we are very happy to spread the jewelry culture all over the world. So let's take advantage of this time that we have with Madame saint jean Are the cameos in Rachel's diadem real cameos or are they imitations? They're real cameos, but they're made out of shell. They're made out of shell and not out of stone, as we, they usually are in classical cameos, used in jewelry. But they, they are indeed cameos. Can you tell us more about the kind of metal that was used? The metals used are composite uh, materials. The metals are a composite, 
Generally, these are copper alloys. It's a mixture of various types of alloys. One of the jewels was analyzed, and we, that was the Talma uh, crown. And upon analysis, the school performed a kind of a spectro uh, spectrography of the metal, and it was very complex, in fact, which explains why these jewels were not able to be restored in the workshops in which they were manufactured. Because the staff of these workshops had no training in um, using those comp composite materials. So they were entrusted to restorers who are specialized in that type of uh, activity in, in glass and metal. So we have time for a final question to take advantage of your expertise. Did stage jewels influence the creators of precious jewelry? For example, do you think Lalique and Fouquet were influenced by their theater commissions and their theatrical muses? Very certainly in the case of Lalique, uh, they were. There was a proximity between Lalique and Sarah Bernard. He designed a lot of uh, a scenic uh, jewelry for her, and she generally is an inspirer of our new style. We, there were exchanges, I believe, between uh, the, the, the scenic applications and things that were done for the city as well. So thank you so much. It's been such a privilege to have you. Thank you again uh, to Agathe for sharing her knowledge, and we're very pleased that you were able to join us for this sneak preview of the exhibition, which will open soon to the public. We'd like to thank all of our, our watchers. Thank you from all over the world. Thank you to the team, our technical team here, to our interpreter, Jerry, and thank you to Anazita and to, uh, to Celine, who are back there. I know that you've been chatting with them, so they need no, uh, um, they need no introduction. And also, thank you, Julian. Thank this you, is really fun. And join us next time at the Cluny Museum, if you will, and we'll talk about rock crystal in the Middle Ages. Goodbye, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.